Get ready for truth and transparency from an ocean of liberal tears. Welcome to the Blue Shark Show with your host, Mike Lang. So the bond went down in flames, and there's a lot of reasons for it. We're going to talk about some of the reasons we think that it went, you know, basically down in flames, but a lot of it has to do with communication. Now, for Prop A, that was the $355 million bond. It went down basically 69% to 31%, which is huge, huge numbers. Prop B, which was the stadium, went down, you know, it was $39 million. That went down 72, almost 73% to 27%. So that was even a few more percentage points. We look at, we can kind of take it from the beginning and let's look at the 83, I guess, member board that kind of put this together and sent it to a vote for the ISD trustees to vote on. Yeah, so that long-range planning committee actually started out with somewhere around 100. And I thought it was interesting that the only 83 they talked about were the 83 that saw the whole thing through and the 83 that voted unanimously. I have to wonder what happened to the rest of them. Did they see the writing on the wall that, you know, this thing was a, a sham? And that, you know, really on its face, I have it on good authority that initially the talk wasn't what do we need, it's how much money can we get. And when you have a project start out like that, that's supposed to be a project of needs, but you say, well, last time we did 15 cents, we think we can pass 20 this time. That creates a lot of problems because now you've got to backbuild what you're claiming to be these needs. And that's part of that communication problem that I was talking about. When people would ask questions, sometimes you would get your questions answered. Sometimes you wouldn't because it varied depending on what elementary school you would have, what high school you were going to have, what middle school you're going to have. It all changed. So the facts changed. The numbers changed. There wasn't anything that the taxpayers could say, this is going to be one school, two schools, this is what we're going to do. And then to top off everything on the concession speech that, I call it a concession speech, but uh, that Dr. Jeremy Glenn put out, and I'm glad he put something out, but he did use that buzzword equity about all the schools. And to me, when you start using the word equity and you start throwing in money because this school has this, we have to match it with this. Because this school has that, we have to match everything, keep everything level and equitable. So I've got a problem with that to begin with, and I think a lot of people had a problem with the equity part of trying to do more for each school instead of worrying about what we needed, like you said. Yeah, you know, and I found it interesting that they claim the crisis to be a crisis of student space. How much classroom space do we have? And in doing so, they said, well, we're also going to spend $40 million on renovating these elementary schools. And this is from Barbara Townsend herself, school board president. We're going to renovate these elementary schools for equity. And when I hear that, I say... You know, I don't, if we're going to take $40 million, that could build a new elementary school. If these are non-essential repairs being done in the name of equity, perhaps they should rethink that. Then you get into the $57 million worth of fees. I think the voters just saw through the smoke and mirrors that the district tried to pass off by saying, well, 83 out of 83 people all voted unanimously for every line of this. And if you talk to anyone that runs stats, you know, a statistician or anything, that's next to impossible. To begin with, let's not talk about the minutia in the very beginning of communication. Let's talk about the, the committee to begin with, okay? Any committee of 83 people, which apparently was 100 plus before, at the end of the day, when everybody agrees on something and it's 83 people, it, it makes me question the makeup of the committee, number one, and what they did they actually understand what they were voting on or were they, they, were they just fatigued and decide, you know what, we were here for a purpose. Okay, yeah, we're going to vote for that because that's what we got before us. You don't get 83 people to agree on anything. You can't get 83 people to agree on the color of the sky. 
at any given time. So the idea that 83 people are going to agree on spending half a billion dollars, I just don't, I, to me, if you're, if you're going to have a committee of that many people spending that much money and you don't go into it planning on having a minority report, planning on having an alternative plan or a, major, a minority opinion like you would see from, from a Supreme Court setting, when you're spending that much money with that many people, I expect there to be dissension. I expect there to be disagreement. I expect there to be people at the end of the day saying, nope, this isn't the way. It's another way. And so when I see something unanimous about that much money, I, to me, it, 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 was, it wasn't honest on its face from the beginning. I think it was unanimous maybe because they were all sending it to the ISD trustees to vote on for them to send it to the voters. So I think it might have been one of those, okay, we'll just agree there's $394 million. We'll go ahead and agree to move this along to let the voters just decide what they want. Well, that's not the communication end of it because what what part of that? I mean, what school? List the school you're going to build. List another school you're going to build. List everything you're going to do and move it forward. And that's what the committee did not do. And that's where it needs to be revamped and start over again. Throughout the early part of that process, I was initially uh, appointed to serve on that bond steering committee. And I started asking questions. I said, where's this money going? You know, they said $394 million and they repeated that. And they talked about a new high school. But I said, where is this money going? It took two or three weeks for them to give a roughly itemized thing. And then when I looked at that, I said, that's $57 million in fees. Dr. Glenn, what's the standard here? Well, the standard according to our attorney is 5.5%. I said, look, I'm no math magician. But $57 million out of 394 is not 5.5%. Uh, something is off here. And he said, well, you know, some of that might be built in for inflation. So I'm like, why don't you guys say that? Why don't you stop talking to the voters like they're stupid? Because they are not. And that's one thing where I think the district is totally tone deaf. They think that voters are just as dumb as a box of rocks. And, you know, having grown up here, we can smell BS from a mile away. Well, you know, it's always been done that way, and they just followed a cookie-cutter pattern, and that's what the architects and developers and everybody told them to do, and that's what their own committee told them to do, so that's what they're going to do. But I think with the way interest rates are going, with the way inflation is going, with the teacher shortage, and, and I've heard both you know, pros and cons, and is there really a teacher shortage, is there not? Um, there's a lot of things going on right now. That, appraisals. The, oh, the appraisals, that's a big one. They just came out um, a little bit late, but they came out. So, um, you know, people were saying, now that was nefarious. They were holding them. Whether they were holding them or not, your appraisals still went up. And we can do another segment on on taxes and appraisals and what the effective tax rate is, no new revenue rate, all that stuff. But getting back to some of the reasons why people voted no. First, it was $394 million. With another $130 million, you know, part of that's interest and whatnot we have to pay back. So little old Granberry, half a billion dollars plus. And I think that was a big ticket, kind of a sticker shock for a lot of people. And like you said, the appraisals. Let's talk about some of that. You know, having talked to some property owners around here, they saw their appraisals go up double, triple, some even quadruple. And if you have commercial property and that quadruples in value, where do you get that money from? Do you just absorb it? No, because you probably don't have that much profit to begin with. So you have to pass that on to consumers as if inflation isn't bad enough, as if these appraisals aren't bad enough. I would argue, based on members of the Long Range Planning Committee, that there are certain members of that committee who said, we want to be sure we are attracting quality families to Hood County. What is a quality family? What is a quality family? Is that a family that doesn't live in a double-wide? 
Is that a family that can afford to spend $1,000 a month and rent to the state to maintain and continue to live in property they own outright? Someone using that phrase alone, it's kind of offensive. <laughs> I mean, quality families? My precinct is full of quality people. I don't care where you live or what you live in or how many kids you have or what you drive. You pay your taxes in this county and you vote, you're a quality for person as far as I'm concerned. So the fact that that was even part of the mental makeup of the people that were brain trusting this, this bond, they were coming from the wrong place from the very beginning. We need to serve the people that are here now. P ideas for the future, but you serve the people that are here now. Well, see, and that is a big part of the issue is that they don't like a lot of the people that are here now. You start talking to the elites, they don't want lower middle class. They don't even want middle class. They want to gentrify every neighborhood. I look at a neighborhood like Indian Harbor. When I was growing up, Indian Harbor had a bunch of trailer homes. A few years back, they said, hey, no more trailer homes are going to be brought in. Trailer home finally lives out its life cycle. And now you have to have a stick build. Well, who's doing the stick builds? Well, all these developers. Who's on all these committees? Who's in the chamber? Who's controlling all these P and Z committees and all these HOAs. So developers, they all stand to benefit. You know, and you have to look at that when you analyze why do they make the decisions they do. And I'm all for people making money, taking care of their properties, starting businesses, doing what they need to do as a builder. But you're right. They have ulterior motives. They want their business to grow. And everything that got put on the back burner was the main thing. Kids and teachers. You know, I didn't hear a lot through any of the bond steering committee, through any of the other pack that they had about kids and teachers. Now, the bond is about brick and mortar, and I get that. But the whole gist of this whole thing is to teach the students and who's going to teach them? The teachers. And the students need to be taught the reading, writing, and arithmetic. And that kind of brings us into the other thing that you were going to bring up, John. Well, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to drop a hand grenade here. The porn book issue. Let's, let's, let's talk about the white elephant in the room. Um, at the essence of the porn book issue is the fact that we don't trust the school board and Dr. Glenn, unfortunately, at this point to make good decisions for our district because they've keeping porn in our school libraries. They're keeping it there and they've been aware of it for months and they keep it there and they wring their hands and they clutch their pearls and act like they don't know what to do on a simple solution. And I don't want to get us off on the porn book issue, but if I don't trust you to know that a porn book in my school library shouldn't be there, why would I trust you with half a billion dollars? Well, and you go back to the makeup of those uh, steering committees, those uh, book review committees. And when you have the head of the largest law firm in town that says to a meeting of librarians, if you get sued for putting a, a porno book in your library, I will defend you for free. And then you have him be the overwhelming and overbearing voice in these discussions, what do you expect? I expect the voters to vote down the bond. That's what I expect, and that's what happened, and it went down in an embarrassing fashion. So Dr. Glenn and the school board and the, and the committee, if you have any questions as far as what happened to your bond, go back to the beginning. It's been mishandled from the beginning, and all it really took was pointing out some very basic facts over the last six, eight weeks by some very specific people and your bond went down flaming because the people have lost faith in your leadership. The bond proves that. So now you get a chance to come back around and make it right. And we're going to see if you took the lesson that the voters sent you. Well, you know, and I, I really don't think that they will take that lesson. I think that they will eventually, uh, when they do kind of get their head screwed back on straight, they'll blame the loss of the bond issue on misinformation. Uh, they'll blame the loss of the bond issue on 
people voting on their emotions and they'll blame the loss of the bond issue on the appraisal districts and they'll blame the loss of the bond issue on everybody but themselves. And it's like I said, communication is key. Tell the citizens exactly what you're going to do. Don't change it. Don't move it around. Don't move the goalpost. Tell them what you're going to do. That's what you're doing with the money. And you move along. Because when you factor in the books, the LGBTQ issues that we've had here in Granbury. CRT. CRT. Everything. Not just in Granbury, but throughout the United States. And you're expecting teachers to teach reading, writing, arithmetic, which is almost none now because of star testing and everything else. And then you go to, but wait a minute, they also have to teach social, emotional learning and the social aspect of it. So talking about social, emotional learning, uh, my wife, who's a retired educator, she was in the classroom for 24 years with special education students. And so she's familiar with social, emotional learning, the concept of it. And she said there's lots of things that were very useful in the classroom regarding social, emotional learning. But just like the left always does, they take something um, repugnant like CRT, they take something like an established program that teachers have come to, come to, to lean on, and now they're going to inject the CRT into this social emotional learning program. So they're going to spoil something that teachers have come to rely on and trick some teachers to continue teaching this, this process and these concepts that have now been, again, been uh, poisoned by, by the whole CRT mindset. So it's not, it's not good enough anymore to say we're against CRT. You've literally got to look at every single thing that the school district is pushing toward your children and see changes that are being made to see if they're injecting the CRT and these LGBTQ, AIIP, QRZ. You've got to follow things. You can no longer sit back and trust because we've been shown time and time again that when it comes to county government, school government, if you turn away and just say, you know what, they know what they're doing. They're the professionals. This is what we end up with. You end up with porn in your schools. Okay. <laughs> well, and, you know, beyond that, not only do we have porn in our schools, and this is here in GISD, but we also do not have, according to the Follett Online, the online card catalog search for Granberry ISD, there is not a single copy of the Holy Bible within our schools. And I have heard every one of those trustees at one point or, or another say that we have to put God back in the classroom. How can you say you're putting God back in the classroom and God back in the schools if you do not allow copies of the Holy Bible into your libraries? That, I think, is one area that should enrage the Christians around here. You know, we have these people that try to tell us the what we want to hear, but whenever you use their own resources and look to see, is there a copy of the Holy Bible, a single copy, at Granbury High School, Granbury Middle School, Acton Middle School, or any of the elementaries, and the results come up zero. There are no Bibles. You know, uh, Monica Brown and Karen Lowry, who have been really uh, instrumental in getting these things done about the books and the book reviews, and they have uh, a list of Bibles for kids that are really good Bibles that could be put into the classroom. So... Anybody out there, please get with Monica and Karen, and maybe we can get some of those Bibles put in the classroom, both at the elementary, middle school, and high school levels, uh, which you know would be age appropriate and, and how they learn for those for those books. Because everything else is in there, we might as well put, like you said, God back in the schools, right? Yeah, and you know it's interesting. I had emailed Dr. Glenn and. Uh, Barbara Townsend, the school board president, Dr. Glenn says, well, I can guarantee you there are copies of the Bible in the schools. Well, that may be true, but it may be in one or two teachers' classrooms. The whole point of this is to make the Holy Word, as written and discerned by God, available to the students. If we can't do that, then what's the point? 
If we can't do that, is that representative of this community? Nate, you're, you know what? You're explaining to me by very one very poignant example why the bond went down in a flaming fireball. Right there. Because people don't trust the people that we have elected to put in those positions of power. We've since realized we can't trust them, at least right now. So, you know, GISD, come back around for that bond in November if you want to. But until you actually f repair the, the breach in the trust level between the citizens and voters and the school board and the school superintendent and the way our schools are being run, until you fix that breach, I think you're wasting your time coming back to the voters. Because we don't need a retread of what we were just trying to, f trying to be fed. We want to trust, trust you and then we'll give you some money to expand our schools and to, and to push us into the future. But don't come to us with your, with your, with your hat out in your, in, your, in your hands out asking for money from me if I can't trust you with a very basic decision. Because spending $500 million or somewhere in there when you consider the, the interest that's involved, if I can't trust you to take porn out of my schools, why would I hand you a check for half a billion dollars? And, and, and Dr. Glenn, the school board, it, you don't need to look any further than that, not because that's the only message, but that's to me a poignant message as an example of the, the failure of communications that's led to this failure of the bond. And so before you try to push us something else, you better do a really good postmortem on why that bond failed because you should first figure out what we really need, then you figure out what we need to really build, and then you figure out what it's really going to cost. And those three things, I don't get any impression those three simple things were done when it comes to this bond that we just shot down. I think they did see it coming because within the last few days, there were several high-level administrators and employees of GISD that got out ahead of their skis, you know, uh, stepping out into the online forums and trying to basically disrespect anybody that voted against the bond. Oh, you hate kids. Oh, you hate teachers. You hate public ed. You're bought and paid for by West Texas billionaires or whatever the narrative of the day is. And watching all that, that's when I knew that the bond was going to fail because they wouldn't have acted like the jerks that they acted like if they thought that it had a chance. And clearly they knew that it didn't stand a chance. Well, it's no longer good enough, you know, and, th and this goes not only for your individual voters, teachers, whatever you do, elected, elected officials. It's no longer good enough to step into the voting booth, which, by the way, there was some, some hay made about the fact that the teachers were being incentivized to go vote by the district, in which I, it's silly. It's absolutely silly. But you know what? Teachers aren't stupid. They read right through this bond. So they think that sending the voters to the voting booth with an incentive is going to support them and help their chances. But I hate to tell you, the teachers aren't stupid. They know this bond was a bad idea, too. So all you did was end up showing your bias by giving a silly incentive to go vote, assuming that these, these teachers are just going to scurry to the voting booths and do exactly what the school board and Dr. Glenn says or, this, or the bond people said. But no, teachers are intelligent, educated people. They went through this like everybody else, Dr. Glenn, and they voted their conscience. And I'm just, I'm pretty sure even your teachers didn't support this by an overwhelming measure because it was such a stinky, stinky deal. And the, and the way they conducted themselves in the behind the scenes aspects, when they were uncovered by certain people during this, it just showed it all the more that it was disgusting from the very beginning. They were, they were selling a bond that the 1990s would have issued, okay? You can't sell a bond today. The voters today are different than the voters were five years ago, tremendously different. And for them to insult the voters the way they did with this communications package they chose is ridiculous, and the vote stands for itself. Because this bond, I believe it had challenges from the very beginning just based upon the economic winds of the world right now. But when you add into that the failure of the communications and the 
mistakes made time after time, tripping over themselves as this bond pushed forward. Nobody on my side of the equation was surprised the bond went down in a flaming, flaming problem. My real question is, did they see it coming? Did they really see it coming? We spoke earlier about the teachers and, you know, bless the teachers uh, for the patience they have, the things they have to go through for state issues, which I tried to change for star testing, a lot of the star tests, but stand up. You've got people here in your community. This is not like some of the communities in California, New York, where you have, you see it on, you know, libs of TikTok, where you have, you know, teachers coming out, you know, transgender this and that in the classrooms and teaching the kids different things about that. And please stand up. I think that a lot of the teachers are afraid to stand up and... If they can express their views as a homosexual, a transsexual, a pansexual, whatever sexual they may be, you as a teacher can certainly stand up and say, look, I'm a heterosexual female, whatever it may be, one man, one woman, married. There's nothing wrong with you standing up for your biblical principles. There are people here in Granbury that back you 100%. And if you are that teacher or that administrator that thinks you're a woman but you're a man or thinks you're a man but you're a woman, not going to go along with your mental illness and not going to pretend that you are something different. And that's what this community is asking for, whether it's in the bond, whether it's in the teachers, whether it's in the trustees. That's where we're headed across the United States. And if you don't read the news or look at the news and understand that, then you've got your head buried in the sand. Please like and subscribe. Hit that subscribe button for The Blue Shark Show. And also go to our website, theblueshark.show.com for extended member content. Thank you, Shark Show out.